Anyway, good morning to you. Uh, you've passed a Clive is on leave this week, and so you've got the seed team again. <coughs> and of course, after the COVID lockdown, this is the first time that we're together again as a body. And you know, the Bible tells us not to forsake the gathering or the assembling of yourselves together. Don't forsake it. Make sure you meet as a church. So I'm so pleased that we can again be together as a body of believers. It's important. It's important in our Christian lives. And I thought this morning, as we together again as a body, to think of the body and us as parts of that body and what our functions are within this body, which is the church. Unfortunately, there are a number of very illustrative passages of Scripture which talk about this in the New Testament. And I'm going to be looking at three of those passages because each of them is figurative. It uses an illustration to bring out a truth. And as I say, each of these passages is that type of passage. But before we go into that, let's just ask the Lord's blessing upon the studying of his word. Precious Lord, we thank you that we can be together again as a body, and we pray your blessing, Lord, as we come together to worship you. We pray our worship of you would be acceptable to you, Lord, and particularly this morning, we pray that you would speak to us through your word as you do every time we open it. So bless us, speak to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The first of the three passages is, all of them are very well known, <clears throat> but this is probably the best known of the three. It's about the body, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the body and the parts of the body. <clears throat> it's 1 Corinthians 12 from verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, is it therefore not part of the body? Or if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were the eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would be the body? But now indeed there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think are less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there may be no schism, division in the body, 
but the, that the members should have the, <coughs> the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Okay, we, <laughs> that deserves a full sermon on its own, but I'm going to just draw three important lessons from this, and then we'll push on. The whole emphasis of the passage is to stress the differences between the different parts, the eye and the ear and the hand and the nose. We're all different. We all have different abilities, God-given abilities, and those abilities are to be used in the body to help the body function as it ought. We're all different with different talents, different abilities. We each have a unique job to do, a unique function in the church. That's the first point. The second one is that while some Functions in the church are very visible, like my role this morning is very visible and very obvious. There are others which are in the background. Perhaps some things happen in this church that you don't even know about. Some people are working in the background and you're not even aware of it, but you are aware that the body is functioning. If one of those parts didn't do their job, you would know about it. If one of the parts was suffering, the whole body would suffer. Okay, so the body is made of these different parts. We are not to be jealous or envious of another part, perhaps a visible part. I wish I could preach. But we should have for one another mutual love, mutual respect, and mutual appreciation. And then finally, this question of the one person suffering, and because of that, the whole body suffers. It's very important for us to know who is suffering and what can I do to help that person. Am I praying for those who are suffering? Here, yeah, Ramona and the whole Maharaj family are in desperate need of prayer. Ramona's husband is in hospital in a critical condition with COVID. They are suffering. Uphold them in prayer. So I need to ask myself then, do I know my role in the church? It's quite clear <laughs> that there are no unnecessary bodies or parts of the body. Every part is necessary. So do I know what my job is in the church? Am I doing it to the best of my ability? Or is the church suffering because I'm neglecting to do what God has ordained me to do? Am I aware of those in the church who are suffering? Am I doing my best to ease their suffering? Am I praying for them? The second passage I want to refer to is John 15, the first eight verses, where Christ tells us that he is the vine and we are the branches. Now, the first illustration of the body and its different parts stress the differences between us, the eye and the ear and the head and the foot, the differences. This one that Christ teaches us stresses the sameness. We are all branches of the vine. Let me read the first few verses. Jesus says, and it's important to note, these are Jesus' words. I am the true vine, 
and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may, may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. He was speaking to his apostles. But abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Again, let's draw out of this three quick lessons. Firstly, it's very clear that every Christian, every branch of the vine is expected to bear fruit. No, not expected, must bear fruit. It says the branch that does not bear fruit is removed from the vine. So every branch of the vine must bear fruit. That's us. We need to ask ourselves, am I bearing Christian fruit in my life? Secondly, those parts that are bearing fruit can expect what? Pruning. It says every branch that bears fruit, every branch that bears fruit is pruned by God the Father. Every single one of them. That's us. God prunes us. Why? To make us more fruitful. You prune the fruit tree or the vine in order to have bigger and better fruit, to make it more fruitful. And that's what God is doing to each one of us. He is pruning us to make us better. But it hurts, doesn't it? Do you experience God's pruning? When he snips off that part of your life that you really liked, and now it's gone. God prunes us to make us more fruitful. So here we are, parts of the body with a unique job to do. Hopefully we're doing it to the best of our ability. But Christ warns us here that we mustn't try and do that job in our own strength. He says, without me you can do maybe a little bit less well, maybe not quite such a good job. No, he says, without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. So you're trying to do this job all on your own without abiding in Christ, you're wasting your time. Nothing. We've got to Stick close to Christ. We've got to abide in him and him in us. Take the branch off the vine and it can never bear fruit. The fruit comes from the vine, not from the branch. The branch has to be stuck on the vine before there's any fruitfulness in that life. So that's what we have to do. To be fruitful, we've got to abide in Christ, draw closer to him and allow allow him to draw closer to us, abiding in Christ. And what happens when that happens? When we do that, we become more fruitful. <clears throat> he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. So again, we need to ask ourselves, am, am I being fruitful in my Christian life? How can I bear bigger and better fruit? And that's an invitation for pruning. 
We need to draw closer to Christ, depend on him, and allow him to make our lives fruitful. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself. It only bears fruit when it's part of the vine. And our lives can only be fruitful. Our parts in the body can only work optimally when we are abiding in Christ. We come to the third and last illustration, and that is the one I want to focus on this morning. And that is the one that says we are living stones being built into a spiritual house. You'll find it in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 4 to 8. <clears throat> 1 Peter 2 verses 4 to 8, which reads as follows. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him, and it's speaking of Jesus, he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. <clears throat> therefore, if you who believe, uh, sorry, therefore to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Okay, again, three lessons out of this passage. Firstly, note that we are living stones, not living bricks. This is a stone wall that's being built, not a brick wall. You say, well, okay, so what's the difference? Well, in, in my life, I, I've designed and built two big houses, and I've laid many, many thousands of bricks. So I know about bricks. And during the lockdown, I've been building a stone wall. So I'm into stones, and I know about building stone walls. And let me tell you, the technique of building with bricks and building with stones are totally different. And we are living stones, not living bricks. If you order a pile of good face bricks, then what marks them as being good is that they all exactly the same shape and size, all exactly the same color, there's no difference between them, and the builder just go, picks up brick and lays it and then picks up the next one, paying no attention to the individual bricks. What you want is uniformity. That's bricklaying. But with building with stone, it's totally different. You can't just lay a row of stones. You've got to find the place where the stone fits. So let's imagine in the stone wall, there's a little gap here, <coughs> and I need to put a stone into that gap. And I've got a pile of stones there, and I go and look for a stone that will fit here. What about this one? No, it's too big. Try another one. No, too small. That one looks about the right size. Try it. No, it's the wrong shape. So I keep on looking, and eventually I find a rock that looks just about perfect. It's the right shape. It's the right size. It's the right color. It's the right texture. I take it and put it in. Oh, it's almost perfect. Almost. But there's this little bit down here which is getting in the way. 
So I get my chisel and four pound hammer. What is four pounds in metric? Two kilogram hammer? Anyway, I get my four pound hammer, I chip off the little chip of stone, try it, A, almost right, bit more. Chip. The pruning process. And eventually, the rock is just perfect for this position. So I get the dogger, and I put the dogger there, and put the rock in, yeah, looking lovely, get my level. Is it vertical? No, it's leaning back a bit. So I need to push a little wedge of stone underneath it to get it perfectly vertical. Sometimes we need a little bit of extra help. Anyway, now my rock is absolutely perfect. This is what we are, living stones, that God is choosing you, the unique you, to put you into a unique position in the wall of the spiritual house. Only you fit in that position. Nobody else will. Only you, as part of the body of Christ, has the correct functions to work in that part of the body. Let's look quickly at the cornerstone. Christ is the cornerstone of the spiritual building that is being built. Notice it's a spiritual building. It's not a real building. It's a spiritual building in heaven, I think. But it's a spiritual building that's going up, and Christ is the cornerstone. Now, today, when you're building with bricks, you put up profiles and get them nice and vertical and exactly in the right place, and then you just string a line between them and lay the bricks to the line. But in the old days, the shape and size of the building was determined by the cornerstone. The very nature of the building was determined by the big cornerstones that were placed at the corners. And then lines were stretched between the cornerstones and the stone wall was built according to the line determined by the cornerstones. It was the cornerstone that determined the whole size, shape and nature of that building. And Christ is the cornerstone. And the, the verse, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That verse is quoted five times in the Bible. It originally occurs in Psalm 118, verse 22. Then Jesus himself quotes that in Matthew 21, 42. Then Peter quotes it before the Sanhedrin as accounted for in, in Acts 4, verse 11. And then Paul quotes it in the Ephesians 2, 20. And then Peter, <coughs> Peter finally quotes it in this passage, 1 Peter 2, verse 7. It must be an important verse if it's given five times in the Bible. Christ is the chief cornerstone of the building. Now, I don't know about you. The idea of me being a unique part of the body with a unique function, well, that puffs up my ego. I think that, that sounds great. Being a vine of the branch, uh, sorry, being a branch of the vine doesn't sound all that exciting, except when I think of the fruit that it's going to bear. That, that's exciting. But being a living stone in a wall don't sound too exciting to me. Until you realize the purpose of this building. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. We know the house is a spiritual building. A holy priesthood is required to offer up sacrifices. But it doesn't tell you exactly what this building is. But Ephesians 2 gives us some more detail. It says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints 
and members of God's house, sorry, members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together, the tripping of the stones, they fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being fitted together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Wow. We're going to be God's house. He's going to be at home in this building of which we are living stones. You want to be a living stone? You bet. God's house, being at home with God. Can you imagine it? <clears throat> so that's what this is all about. That's what being part of the body of Christ is all about. That's what doing your job there is all about. That's what being fruitful is all about, that we can be God's home. Wow. Wow. So if you are experiencing God's tripping, oh, and by the way, when you put this stone into the wall with the dog up, you can't build on top of it until the dogger has dried and set. You've got to leave it alone. You ever felt God's absence in your life? He's busy laying a stone somewhere else, and I'm just sitting there. It's necessary that the dogger dries and hardens before you put another stone on top of it. And this is what God is doing to us. He's busy picking our stone for the exact spot. No other stone will fit there, just us. Getting us into that place, chipping away for the bits he doesn't want, allowing the dog to dry so that his home will be perfect. Our role in the church. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge of your word, Lord, and its clarity. We thank you, Lord, that we are part of the body. Help us, we pray, to fulfill our functions, that the body doesn't suffer because of our part not working. Help us, Lord, as branches of the vine, to be fruitful. Help us to accept the sniffing away, the pruning process, that we might be more fruitful for you. And Lord, we thank you that we can be living stones in your home one day. We look forward to that. So bless each one of us, we pray. Help us to examine our souls in the light of your word, Lord. And we pray that as we do so, that you would work in each one of our lives. You would help us to abide more in Christ. Stick to the vine with all our strength. Allow Christ to work through us. So we thank you for this, Lord, and we pray that you would do this in each one of our lives now. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>